is covering a topic that's really near and dear to me. Do companies with more diverse workforces perform better financially? If so, why? There's still a big imbalance in female representation at the top level of tech companies. Why is this and what can be done about it? To guide us through this one, please welcome Editor-in-Chief of News Maidens, Zuzana Ziometsa, who will be talking with Director of the United Nations Development Program, Randy Davis, Managing Director of the Women's Forum, Chiara Corazza, and the CTO of Cisco Systems, Susie Wee. I'm really happy to see such a big crowd. This is a wow. super important topic for us. And just, I, just to get an idea of who's in the audience, can I see a show of hands? If you are a man, put your hand up. <laughs> good, very good. I'm assuming the rest of you are women. Thank you for joining us. We have an important topic that is both good news and bad news. The good news is that Various reports indicate without a reasonable doubt that there is a relationship between diversity and profits, okay? So if your company is diverse, you are more than likely to have above average profits than if you are a company run by a homogenous group. This is good news. The bad news or the confusing news is that despite the certainty that we now have, this is not moving the dial on increasing the number of women in leadership. So to help explain how the hell that is possible and what we can do are my fantastic panelists, Susie, Kiara, and Randy, who will, uh, to start us off, who will explain what it is that they're doing in the world, what their involvement and connection to gender equality is. If you could start us off, Susie. Hi there, my name is Susie Wee, and uh, I am the Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of uh, Cisco DevNet. And DevNet is our developer program, which we founded about five years ago. We just crossed over half a million members. Um, the key is that for Cisco's business, we have partners and customers all around the world. And these are people who are um, using our products, installing networks, running kind of mission critical uh, infrastructures. And clearly, because it's a technical community, it's very global. But there's also a lot of men and fewer women in that community. Uh, but as we're helping them get the software skills that they need and really you know, build up the skills for the next century of software products, what we're doing is making sure to, uh, to look out for the women in that community, try to increase the number of women in that community. And for those who are already in it, try to make sure they're visible and they get the promotion opportunities that they, that they deserve. Awesome. Thank you. Kiara, can you tell us more about your work? Yes, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Kiara Kurtz. I'm the, the managing director of the Women's Forum for Economy and Society, and I'm very proud about it because it's my way to give back to the community. I'm really convinced that this is a disrupted world. Uh, woman voice, woman vision, woman added value can really make the difference and help us all together for men and women to construct something more inclusive and, and better for the future of our children. And I'm really convinced also that the team of today, this disruption, it's a huge opportunity because disruption can accelerate this inclusion, can give opportunities to women to be there, the place where they have to be, to be change maker and to bring something different. Differentiation is richness. Differentiation gives results. And by the way, we can just not um, spoil, waste half of the talent of the planet if we want to make something meaningful and impactful. And it's what we're doing in the Women's Forum. Amen. Thank you, Kiara. And now everybody meet Randy Davis. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here and so happy to see men in the audience. Um, I, I represent, I'm very loud, so I always have technical problems. Um, I, I represent UNDP. We're an organization that works primarily with governments and we're working very much to build an enabling environment for women to participate in the labor force. There are huge differentials in terms of women's labor force participation and women's economic empowerment. We're working both with governments 
and with societies to change the concepts of, of uh, stereotypes and what is a, an appropriate role for women in society, to put in place policies that enable women to get into the workforce and the social policies that are necessary from the public policy point of view. But also we're working a lot with companies themselves to change attitudes to understand that diversity improves profitability, but it also builds a better work culture and it benefits the societies in which companies are operating. So I think as we transition into a future where companies see that they have a role, a social role, a social responsibility, especially multinationals that are operating in foreign countries, they have a social responsibility to the communities in which they work. We are moving beyond just corporate social responsibility to how companies can change their attitudes internally and build happy, productive, and what we call decent work environments for all of their workers. Super. I'm really glad you mentioned that because I think there must be a reason why women thrive in certain companies and don't thrive in others. We've all heard the stories of how many women actually get their business degrees, get STEM degrees, and then we see most of that talent disappearing as it transitions from education into the workforce. So the companies where you have seen um, that this is actually working, where women are thriving, can you tell us what they do differently to make sure that that happens? Yeah. So, uh, so I can start out here, which is that I think the main thing is that they're, they're accepting of work being done in a new way. So I think sometimes your tendency is that this is how work is done. You know, if someone leaves, it's probably a male who might have left, and then we'll fill it with someone who does things in exactly the same way. And if that happens, you're going to continue to perpetuate and get the same people in the same jobs, especially in an industry like technology as well, where there's obviously a male-dominated industry. But those who are really open to accepting new ideas, accepting new ways, the way that I do my job is probably different from how the prior male did his job. And so just to be uh, accepting that there can be a new way that we can get these things done. And a woman who comes in is probably going to look different from the male who's done the job before. But let's open up for new ways and we can achieve more in that. Uh, on my team itself, actually, um, I run a developer program. It's very technical. You would expect mostly males. I'm actually fairly proud that on my leadership team, I have more than half women on there. So my directors and my senior directors. It can be done. It can be done. And we interface with the men across the company in different places. And I think they view them as, you know, top candidates and as their peers who they work with. Awesome. Kiara, what have you seen working? Um, what do the organizations that you work with, what do they do to ensure that women thrive? I think that the first thing is not to oppose men and women. That would be really a mistake. 90% of CEOs are still men. And if we don't convince them, that they need women because women can bring added value performances. Just to give, a, just to give an example that you know all, it's the study that we do in the Women's Forward McKinsey. Uh, with more diversity, I just say more diversity, we can create 240 million jobs from now to 2025 and add 12 trillion dollars at the GDP, then I mean it's not just because it's fair, it's not just because it's politically correct, it's not because it's nice, it's figures. It's results, it's performance, and that we have to explain it. And we work, for instance, in the Women's Forum with many CEOs that are very, very keen to change sure, things and to promote women. And but what do the companies do to make sure that women are, once they're there, okay, they, they get the power, they, they, have to they be get promoted that they to need leadership, women. Then how do you get them to stay and how do you enable them to thrive in that context? You have before to convince them that they need women and that the competence are there. Because they also say, oh, we don't have the women in the pipelines. If you just lead by example, showing that women can do it and be able to do it, then it comes. And, and I come back to what I just saying before. We also have to be um, certain that women do the appropriate studies and be there where we need to be. There are only 6% of women in tech. That means that all the big companies, Google, Microsoft, Cisco, have a difficult uh, to recruit engineers, coder, and so on and so forth. And it's just our choice to prepare our children. Very often their mothers say, don't do mathematics, it's too difficult. Don't do scientific studies, it's too difficult. And as a result, we have less than 28% of women in scientific matter worldwide. 
this is an issue. It's not just the choice of the companies. The companies can recruit if the people are there, if the competence are there. And the second, I think, the government has a very strong responsibility for that. Because if they lead by example, if they have an equal government, as it's in Canada or France, where you have women at a very strong position like defense, like justice, like transportation, like, uh, um, I mean, regalian import jobs, and so on and so forth, you show to the companies that these women are capable. And they be obliged to think about women when they change. And the last example is that just three weeks ago, we have now a CEO woman for Solday, and it's a man who promoted. Thank you. Randy, what have you seen working? Yeah, I think, I think role modeling is one important aspect, but it's not enough. No. So companies need to actually take on a commitment to diversifying their workforce, and this is um, women, men, um, people of different heritage, uh, color, race, uh, there, there are a range of areas in which diversity counts, and there are many, many things companies can do beyond just putting a woman in a leadership position, but it requires leadership commitment to do them. So the first thing, UNDP is working with many companies to actually try and do assessments on where the gender gaps are. They're in pay, they're in all um, levels of management, and you see a real problem at middle and senior talent. Um, where women are coming in at equal levels often at the at the bottom They're not being able to progress in their career because of a number of barriers some which are Often talked about such as child care and the need for flexi life policies But they go beyond that sometimes there's unconscious bias that prevents women from moving up the corporate ladder So first thing you need to do is really understand what are the problems in the companies you need to have a leadership commitment to assess the problems, look at them, and come forward with some concrete strategies on what to do to overcome the challenges, mostly related to acquisition and retention of female talent. The talent is there, and the problem is we need to pull it out, we need to mentor it, nurture it, and, and keep it in our companies. And often that requires a change in our corporate attitude. You need leadership commitment. Okay, uh, fair enough. We need leadership commitment. Can we get more specific? Because that can mean many things in many different environments. In some places, we have seen quotas working. In, um, regarding the pay gap, um, the statistics I've read show that there's a $16,000 difference between women and men in, um, in the tech industry. So we're seeing very large areas that need work. You're saying they need committed work. I'm looking for suggestions from you guys about what can be done specifically. What kind of programs have you seen? What ways to shift the culture? Because we have been talking about this problem and pointing to it for about a decade now. And not only do we know for sure that the problem exists, but it seems to be getting worse and not better. So we need to take the next step now and talk about what we can do. And Susie, you are fidgeting, so I'm assuming that means you've got something to contribute. Go. Well, there's a couple things. So, uh, you know, so first in a in a very solid way. So Chuck Robbins is the CEO of Cisco. He just hired uh, two executive vice presidents, uh, and they're both women. Now he didn't go and just look for only women, and he didn't compromise his standards. Uh, he actually explained that he actually went to his team. When you're out looking for candidates, I want you to bring me a slate that has half women and half men on it. So give me a slate with half men and half women, and then we'll all go and do the deeper interviews. Okay, so, so you start out looking with an equal roster of candidates. Exactly. So okay. once you get that equal roster, then that just opens your mind as you're talking to everybody, and then you choose the best. And so he took Super that, he chose specific. the best, and he ended up with two phenomenal executive vice presidents in very powerful roles. Okay. So that's like at, you know, at the biggest level. At a very small level, I mean, I actually had a child very late in life. I have a three-year-old. Um, I uh, went to Cisco's executive summit, so it's the meeting with all of our vice presidents and above, and uh, I brought my baby with me. I had nothing to do <laughs> uh, to, to put her elsewhere. I brought her with was me. She, then? she was uh, a f like less than a year old. Okay. So I had her in the carrier. I brought my parents with me so they could watch her in the hotel room, but I brought her to breakfast with me. It was the first baby to attend a Cisco Executive Summit. <laughs> but the thing that happened is that uh, my boss's boss 
when I came in with the baby, he was like, oh, can I hold her? And, you know, Maybe it's a bit nervous. he'll bring his baby. <laughs> Wouldn't that be progress? Yeah, but just the fact that he did that made me know it's okay, right? right? It's actually welcome that she's here and that they can tell I'm making the effort to be there. Right. And that just helps a lot. It's these small things that can make a big difference. Okay. Any other very specific uh, solutions that work that you have seen, Kiara? Yes, I just wanted to jump uh, on what um, has been said. Um, yes, I think that many companies uh, really are leading by example doing things because you talked about laws. A, a country as Ireland, 300,000 uh, in inhabitants, they're number one in all the statistics as the most gender favorable country in the world. But there's still 37% difference of, uh, of pay. Then, yeah. I mean, laws, many countries have laws for, for pay and for equal pay, and it doesn't work. I just wanted to come back to the quotas, and then I will give some examples. Quotas uh, work or doesn't work, it depends from the countries, and it depends on how mature is the ground. Uh, in France, five years ago, there was less than 8% of women in the boards. Now there are 42%. We're number one in the world because the law was there. But women were prepared, were ready to go, and they get, was a big advantage for all these boards because they've been professionalized. Myself and in different boards, I see the difference. We bring a difference. We just use the half of the other part of the brain. And when you use two brains together, you're stronger. Then it's, it's quite important for these companies to have um, people in the boards. The big issue, it's the executive committee, because worldwide we still have 14% only women in the strategic committee and, and executive committee. That means that the governance, it's good at the level of the boards, but not at the level of the executive committee. And this is a real an issue. And it's difficult to make a, a, a quota for that, because uh, you cannot impose to the companies to promote inside uh, your, your company like that. The second thing I wanted to say, that uh, what we do in the Women's Forum with, with big companies, we have a strategic committee that we choose. We choose a, a number of common companies that share our values to improve women leadership in business. That's AXA, that's uh, American Express, that's uh, uh, BNP, that's uh, um, uh, Microsoft, uh, L'Oreal, Google, Sanofi, uh, Publicity, P&G, and so on and so forth. And with each of them, we work with the CEOs to see what they can do. BNP, you know what they did? They expanded worldwide the same maternity and paternity leave and the same advantage that they have in France. The only difference that in France is paid by the state and the security social. Worldwide, it's paid by the BNP. And I can tell you that for women, it's extremely important because they can, of course, take the leave and come back. Yeah. I just remind you that in the United States, women are not paid during the maternal leave. Just a big difference. Big difference, indeed. Brandy, what have you seen I mean, I, I, I think all of these are excellent examples. There are so many great experiences that we're seeing. I, I would still say one of the biggest challenges is or two would be the corporate culture. And that requires an overhaul on more than just getting women in numbers in the boardroom. So the work that we're doing, um, we're trying to get companies to think in a really holistic way at different aspects of their, what we call their corporate DNA. They look at things like um, how they use communications in, within the company, non-sexist communication, how they advertise as a company, a commitment to gender equality in, in their advertisement and in their internal communication. We look at um, really sexual harassment policies and, and sanctions, and this has been an issue we know in the news lately. Um, we, work-life balance policies, and that was really what um, Susie was alluding to, and we need to see that extended to men, so we're shifting cor cor social norms while we're doing this. So, and I think the new generation of, of men want to have a role in raising their families, and this is important in the tech sector, I think. Um, there are numerous policies, and organizations like ours are trying to keep a database of those so we can share them from different um, companies and, and they can learn from one another. So I think it goes beyond decision making, right down the food chain of company actions. We're also seeing companies like mining companies, um, construction companies, traditionally very male dominated to start to look at how they can diversify uh, industries that were traditionally male-dominated, so they give opportunities to women, to, especially 
to poor women. And this requires really concrete strategies on how you make safe spaces for women, how you guarantee safety in mines, how you um, provide uh, facilities for them. There are, there are really many, many things that companies need to do. And the reason I mention leadership is because it's a process. It's not a one-shot uh, thing that a company can do. Well, changing cultures is one of the most difficult types of change to introduce. It's easier to change a law. It's easier to change spending habits. It's more difficult to change culture. But now that we're here, this is our last question, and I want to make use of the fact that we are at a tech conference, a gigantic tech conference. And I wanted to ask you, do you think there's a role that the tech sector could play in particular? Like, are there solutions, tech solutions, that would help move the dial on gender equality, which, just to give you guys some numbers, uh, we're actually moving backwards on this issue. In 2017, women were, there was 25% of women in leadership positions globally. And a, a year later, we're at 24%, which means that there are a quarter of the companies in the world don't have a single woman in upper management. So we're going back, and we need more tools. What can tech do, do you think, to help, help on this issue? Excellent. Surprise question, but I love it. <laughs> uh, so I think that with some of the tech solutions, so just an idea as we're having it, is that, for example, when you're in meetings, what if we were just recording the meetings and then uh, counting how much time men are speaking and women are speaking. There's an app that does that. <laughs> it's called Are Men Talking Too Much? It's, it's really awesome because sometimes it, it's enough to show people the disproportion yeah. in yeah. order to fix it. And then I think uh, if we really could good. go further and then, you know, when are people cut off, um, that would be another interesting to, thing to count. Uh, right. And, uh, you know, when does someone say an idea and when does it get rediscovered later and someone else gets credit for the idea? I mean, all basic things, true, true. but uh, it could be. And, but, and it's not intentional. Like sometimes when you're just, people are having ideas, then that's interesting, yes. Tech solutions, Kiara? Oh, I think that the, the easiest answer is that technology make your life more fle flexible and the workplace will be completely different and it will be easier for women to work with this flexibility in this less hierarchic system. But the less easy answer would be, I am convinced myself, maybe because I'm Italian, that at the end of the end, innovation, technology, everything, we can go whenever we want, we can conquer the space, but at the end, what is important is the man and the woman, the human being and the health. And if women can be more active in the new technology, probably will have the human side of things will be more put in value. Yeah. Well, I, I've been really inspired the last three days because I've met so many um, tech startups run by women who are doing exactly that. They're trying to find tech solutions for working women. And so I really think the magic bullet here could be really to accelerate progress on getting more women into tech. And again, I would challenge everyone in this room. I have met many of them. They say it's very, very hard to get financing for their startups. So there is an inequality in the, um, the amount of time that they're getting to pitch, the amount of resources they're, they're ac having access to. If we can accelerate that, accelerate women in tech, maybe we're going to make that dent and, and move on some of these things that Susie was talking about. Thank you. Thank you for all your inspiring ideas. We're out of time, but if any of you have questions for these fantastic panelists, um, please come backstage. We'll, uh, we'll be hanging around for a moment. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. It's been great talking to you.